So welcome back to the second set of lectures. We will be by Nikolai Chesimianki on online learning and complex optimization. And we will have one lecture before lunch and the second after lunch. Yes. Thanks for the introduction, yeah. Hi, I'm Nicolo, I'm from Milan. I'll talk about online learning and online convex optimization. Um, so I have 49 slides. And this is, these are not meant for this lecture, but for both lectures. So it uh, will be sort of a nice to you. Actually, I've done it not to be nice to you, but because I'm lazy in writing slides. But, and some of these slides are kind of dense, but uh, well, there will be time to interact and uh, you know, ask questions, and uh, uh, hopefully it won't be too hard. And uh, these are not really classroom style uh, slides. They are definitely classy slides, but not classroom <laughs> style. <laughs> because uh, um, I'd like to, you know, rather, there, rather than teaching, I'd like, like to enthuse people into working on in this area. So maybe I will convey some ideas. So some of them will be detailed with proofs, so some others will be left a little bit sketched. So we'll try to give you sort of a broad picture. I mean, there are, there's a lot of stuff. There are a lot of uh, directions, results, uh, settings. I'll try to give you sort of a wide uh, uh, view and uh, zoom in some interesting technical aspects whenever I feel like it's appropriate. OK, this is the plan. It's very informative. Uh, you, you, well, the game here is that you have to guess the, title of, the titles of the books. And uh, you don't have to do it now. I mean, I don't want you to show off your, your culture. But that's fine. Um, <laughs> OK, so <laughs> yeah, this, I mean, if you were born in the 50s, probably you have this in your, in your house. Not this one in particular, but the other guy. Beautiful and uh, fancy drawn pictures. Yes. Um, OK, so the idea is basically I will start uh, connecting with what Ailey did uh, in the morning. This is just by sheer luck. I didn't plan it, but it turns out to be perfect. And uh, then I will uh, uh, move to the experts uh, bandit kind of uh, scenario. And we will spend uh, the rest of the morning on that. And in the afternoon, if, you are, if you come back, you will see something about the online convex optimization scenario. OK? Good. So we start with the, uh, the machine learning. So actually, OK. Right. So uh, Eli told us this morning uh, um, the, the so-called standard modern of uh, standard model of machine learning, which is a statistical learning. OK. And uh, this is, was introduced by Vap Vapnik. This is a picture of Vapnik, and uh, maybe a few years ago. <laughs> And uh, this is basically, you know, it's basing on the idea that uh, a learning algorithm is, is a mapping uh, from data sets uh, to predictive models, OK? And uh, so you have some uh, set of predictive models. And predictive models are maybe classifiers or regressor. Or they map, in general, they will map uh, data instances to labels. For instance, binary classification, which you can do with, like in spam detection or something else. And the learning algorithms are, again, as I said, are these mappings from training data into, into predictive models. And you can think of a super vector machine or, or about the neural network as a typical example of um, a neural network along with the training algorithm, uh, like back propagation, as a typical example of a learning algorithm associated with, the different, with a certain architecture. Okay? So, what you want to do here, the way you, uh, you work, you analyze, you study uh, machine learning is uh, you want to have, evaluate some notion of risk, which will tell you how good is your trained model with respect to some given loss function, which is uh, possibly capturing the interesting uh, as aspects of the problem. OK. So now, uh, the idea here is how, do, how should I define risk? Risk is, is, is something that will, has to be associated with some data model. Only whenever you have a data model and a, a loss function, you can talk about risk. And uh, right, so now we can look at uh, different uh, notions of risk. One is what we saw this morning, which is the statistical risk, uh, usual notion of statistical risk. 
So in, in a statistical uh, risk, uh, you assume that uh, the training set uh, is drawn from some uh, uh, um, unknown and fixed distribution in an independent way. It's a very nice and, uh, and comfortable assumption. And uh, now you can, uh, now this, the training set is a statistical sample. Now you can uh, uh, apply your learning algorithm to the, to, the, to the training set, which is a statistical sample, and get the model. And then you can uh, look at the expected loss of uh, this trained model on a test example, which is drawn by the same distribution. And if you take expectations, maybe with respect to both the draw, the draw of the training set and the test example, you get the notion of, of risk, okay? At least average risk with respect to the, to the uh, draw of the training set. Okay, so this is the, the bread and butter of statistical learning theory, and this is the kind of notion that we want to uh, bound, control using Rademacher or VC dimension. However, this is not the only possible way in which you can uh, uh, phrase, study, and reason about machine learning, okay? For instance, you may uh, wonder what happens if uh, I refuse, because uh, on, on philosophical grounds I refuse, to uh, assume that there is some uh, IID distribution from which the data is drawn, okay? Can I still, uh, can I still uh, uh, develop a theory of learning without using statistics, okay? So uh, people have done that, uh, and I'm gonna talk about this, exactly, uh, this uh, alternative model of uh, uh, risk, which uh, I like to call sequential risk. Um, maybe I'm the only one who calls it that way. Um, you can call it any way you like. So uh, if data, suppose now that data are not, you know, they're not drawn from some distribution, there's an arbitrary sequence of data, an individual sequence of data that's gener generated by, is being generated by some unspecified mechanism. So now, what can you say, right? You still have your algorithm A, and your algorithm is good at the generating models whenever you feed it with data. So what you can do is that you can feed to the algorithm. Okay, so you want to take in account, want to, to see some learning happening here. So you can feed the growing prefix, prefixes of the data sequence to your algorithm, okay? And uh, then, Whenever you do that, you will get a model, and then you can check how's the performance on the model on the next example in the data sequence, which you see, which you view, interpret as a test example, right? And you can sum up these, uh, uh, these losses. You can sum them up. And uh, uh, maybe you can average them if you like, you know. But uh, it's definitely, you want to see some, uh, something happening whenever, when you, 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 you start uh, uh, feeding longer and longer prefixes of the data sequence uh, to the algorithm. You, you would like to see some, some learning, uh, meaning that uh, this, uh, this uh, sum should not grow at the same rate, but should flatten out, okay? Is that clear? Do you choose the random order on, this, on the item? No, it's given. It's an individual sequence. Uh, I am not, uh, I'm not messing up. It's, 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 someone is spitting out uh, this uh, sequence and I am just uh, feeding uh, you know, one by one. Okay, so any more questions here? Okay, good. So um, over here is another quote. Um, right, so um, now, yeah, we can, we can uh, again uh, try to uh, fix our uh, uh, thoughts on statistical learning and get inspiration there. So one key notion that uh, is uh, uh, a combination of risks in statistical learning is the, what's called the variance error. The variance error tells you that whenever you, your algorithm draws, picks models, chooses models from a given class, a fixed class of models, maybe neural networks with a certain number of uh, hidden units and a certain architecture, then you can uh, talk about the best model, the best, sorry, yes, the best model in the class. Uh, that is the model that minimizes the risk in your, in your class given the data uh, distribution, the fixed and unknown data distribution. And then you can look at uh, what is the difference between uh, the uh, risk of the algorithm that you're using, which is picking modern from the same class, and the, best possible, the risk of the best possible model in the class. This difference is gonna be uh, positive, uh, or maybe zero if you're lucky, uh, because A is, gonna picking, uh, is going to pick uh, uh, models from the same classes as this infimum here. Okay, 
So this is what we look in a statistical learning. And it turns out you can define, a, just like you did with risk, you took statistical risk, you did risk and you defined it. Uh, what did you define? You define the sequential risk. Now you can define something which is the analog of variance error in statistical learning, and you call it regret. So regret is again the same thing, but you 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 don't take risks. You take sequential risks, and now you look at the difference between uh, the cumulative uh, <laughs> loss on the data sequence you're given, one uh, in in, a, in an incremental way of the best model in your class and the uh, cumulative loss of uh, the sequence of models that your algorithm is spitting out as you feed it uh, more and more uh, data examples. OK. So this is going to be, again, you can divide by t if you like to normalize it somehow. But this is something that will, be, uh, um, will tell you how good is uh, on, on an arbitrary data, uh, arbitrary data sequence, how good is your algorithm in uh, uh, finding out the uh, uh, what is the the the, over, the offline overall best model in the class. Okay. Now you see the, this quantity could become uh, potentially negative because here your 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 algorithm is, is free to change a model at each time step. Okay. But on the other hand, we don't have a probability to rely upon. So things can get really nasty uh, if uh, the data sequence is is you know is designed in a certain malicious way. OK? Cool? Right, so now uh, one thing that is nice, is whenever you think uh, uh, about learning in this way, now it, it, you, you end up with a very uh, incremental and uh, local uh, way of learning in which, you know, what you do, you, you have some current model, which is the model that you trained so far on the data that you've seen. And uh, you get some next data element. <coughs> and you test your model on that next, next data element. You find out that maybe it sucks. Uh, so you want to adjust it a little bit. And you make an update. And this update, it's a local uh, optimization update. Because uh, it will be based on the, the state, the previous state, uh, which, is the, which is compressing all the data uh, you've seen so far and the next data element uh, that you see. So it hasn't to be this way. You can memorize the entire sequence you saw, and you can rerun every time the algorithm from scratch. But uh, a, mo a, more, uh, a, a nicer way of uh, designing is actually to, to go through a lo local optimization view and uh, for just uh, uh, have your, uh, the, the current uh, model to uh, represent uh, the data source you saw, you, see so you saw so far, and then just to perform a local update, an incremental update, in order to add the further information to your algorithm. So this is the way we will design and we'll think about this, the algorithms uh, in the online setting. So they will perform a sequence of small adjustments uh, to a, a current model. You know? And then we'll learn this way. So. Right, and I will uh, write this many times. Uh, the goal here is uh, still to control regret, uh, uh, which will be uh, you know, the difference between the cumulative loss of your model sequence and the cumulative loss of the best model in your set. OK? Questions? Cool. Good. So, oops. What, what? OK. So now. Um, you can see, uh, uh, we, can, we can view this uh, process as a game. And this is convenient. This is reasonable because we are not making assumptions on the way the data are generated. So we can just, you know, just uh, think that there is some adversary that is generating the data uh, and trying to hurt us. Or maybe not. We don't know. But uh, it's, it's definitely uh, games are a, a reasonable way to, to, uh, to view uh, uh, a reasonable setting to cast problems like uh, online learn uh, sequential learning. Okay, so so what are the players? There's a player that is generating predictors, and that there's some opponent that is generating the data that is trying, you know, to uh, throw off the predictor and uh, uh, make it uh, incur a, a large a large cumulative loss. Okay, so now we can uh, yeah we move to the second part. And uh, we can uh, uh, draw from literature. Instead of drawing from statistics, uh, we can draw from uh, game theory to get some ideas. 
And I'd like to mention here uh, uh, James Hannan and uh, David Blackwell, who were pioneers in the study of uh, many things, uh, and uh, among uh, others, the, uh, um, the theory of repeated games. So, and uh, if you play a game repeatedly, uh, you can view it as a learning problem, because uh, maybe your opponent is just dumb, and if you repeat the game over and over, you can, uh, uh, you can uh, learn the way the opponent uh, behaves and, uh, you know, um, make uh, uh, and, and have a much larger payoff than the payoff you could have gotten if you had played the, the game just once. Okay? So let me be a little bit more clear about it. You know, just think uh, of a simple zero-sum two-person game. And uh, you have a low, uh, rope player, which will be our learner, and there will be a column player, which will be the opponent. You know, if you play, if you, if you know you'll, you'll play the game once, uh, then, uh, okay, you have minimax theory, which is telling you that uh, you, should, uh, uh, you should draw your action, your row action, from uh, a distribution, which is minimax. And this will be uh, good against uh, any opponent, especially against the maximum opponent, which will be the one that will cause you the maximum uh, expected loss, which is the value of the game. However, you know, if you, if you play, maybe you, you know, if you, if you play the game more than once, then uh, there is a whole new uh, scenario opening up for you, because uh, you know, maybe this matrix is huge. There are, it, it, there are many, many columns, and you cannot compute the minimax strategy because it's too expensive. You don't have time. Or uh, maybe um, you don't know the matrix. The matrix is not completely known to you. It's not accessible to you, so you cannot compute the, uh, the minimax strategy. Or maybe, you know, it, maybe it's not good to compute the minimax strategy because your opponent is dumb and you can have an expected uh, loss as much smaller if you just uh, play a game a, a few times and uh, find out that your opponent is just stupid. Opponent stupid meaning that uh, the data sequence that you're observing is actually easy to learn. So you don't have to use a, a, a hard strategy. You can tailor, you can adapt your strategy to the actual uh, strategy, to the actual data sequences, a sequence that you're observing which corresponds to the a strategy of the opponent is in this game theoretic view. All right. Okay. So, oh, some more pictures. Uh, these are this is Volodya Volk and Manfred. Manfred the, is uh, is in Santa Cruz. Uh, you can go and visit him. He's, he's a very nice guy. And uh, uh, Volodya is in, is in London, I think. And uh, so uh, they um, they were sort of a. Maybe uh, unconsciously, not because they were unconscious, but they were not aware <laughs> of this fact. <laughs> they, Manfred could. Uh, uh, <laughs> they sort of uh, picked up this idea. I mean, you know, it's, science doesn't go in a, in a straight line. You, know, you have these uh, epiphanies, and then you found out that you're just, you know, redoing theory that was done uh, 50 years before, and then you, and you, you connect, you reconcile. So. That they say, okay, we can formulate this repeated game as a sequential prediction problem, because now I can think of a game matrix with uh, you know, as many columns as you like, which is the horizon of the game that you're going to play, and your, the adversary is just uh, uh, making up these columns for you and uh, uh, revealing these columns one by one. So, and this corresponds to the opponent's move. Which, so the opponent is like making up a, 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 a column on the, in, the, in the data, in the loss matrix of the game as, as, the, time, as the game goes on. So uh, you will pick some row, and the opponent will reveal the column, which is its, its move at time t. So you can view this as if, I, OK, and now I can call, you know, I can call the row and, as, and, uh, and my play as the loss which I uh, had at time t whenever I played the action i sub t. Okay? So it's a sequential prediction problem with a time varying loss function. And the, the, the function is time varying because you have a data that define a different losses. So the loss at time t will be defined by the data that you saw that uh, comes up at time t. So maybe it will be defined by the label of the data instance at time t. Okay? I will make this a little bit clearer. So, uh, okay, so now we can, 
get to, ex to the experts game so we can come up with a, with a sort of a general abstract framework that is uh, the, the sort of a standard reference framework to study sequential decision problems in a, in a completely uh, abstract way, if you like. So you have n actions, which corresponds to the number of rows in your game matrix. And uh, you have some unknown deterministic assignment of losses to the actions. Now, here, to make things simple, I'm assuming that the adversary is, uh, you know, your, the adversary is laying down all these columns for you without revealing them. And uh, it, as you play the game, it will reveal the columns one by one. So the game is, goes like this. These are your n actions. These are the rows that you can pick. And you will pick some row. It will have some loss assigned to it. And you will incur that loss. And then you will observe the loss that you incurred. And you will, uh, you will observe the losses of the actions you didn't pick, which corresponds to you know, getting to see every time. After each play, you're getting, you're getting to see the, the whole uh, uh, column of the matrix for, for that time step. All right. So now, now what we want to do, OK, suppose that these losses are some from bounded interval between 0 and 1. So now if you look at the regret, and the regret, again, is the cumulative loss that we experience by playing a different, a different action at each time, as opposed to the uh, smallest possible loss I could have gotten by playing the single best action throughout the, the, the game. And since this, uh, these, these things are bounded, you know, this thing can grow at, at most linearly with time. So we say that we learn whenever we can get this uh, sublinear. And we're interested in a precise rate and the precise dependency um, um, in, on, on the parameters of the game. And the parameters of the game here are really time, the number of columns, and uh, uh, the number of actions or the number of rows. OK. so. Um, you can uh, come up with a lower bound uh, just by assuming that losses are uh, independent uh, coin flips for all the actions. So you just uh, fill out uh, a random matrix with coin flips, fair coin flips, and now you can immediately see that any player strategy will have like a t over 2 uh, loss, a 0, 1 loss, and uh, you know, it's completely blind. There's nothing to learn here. There's no structure. However, just by uh, random statistical deviation, there will be some expert, meaning uh, um, a, a row in this random matrix, uh, which will have, uh, uh, with high probability, uh, will have uh, um, a loss, which is a standard deviation smaller than the average loss. Okay? And if you do your computation precisely, you see that for large n and t, you will have this rate here. Okay? So this is what you can prove as a lower bound whenever the game is completely, you know, is, is actually done in a stochastic way. So what we can prove is that we can match this uh, lower bound not only for stochastic losses, but for any adversarially uh, 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 assigned losses. Okay? And this is done with this very simple strategy, which is called hedge. And uh, the idea is that you have to use randomization because your sequence is adversarial. And uh, so you want to pick an action with the probability proportional to uh, the total loss of the action up to now which you can compute because you observe the losses of all actions. Okay? And so you, you give an a overwhelmingly high probability of picking the action that uh, did the best so far, historically. But you also give some uh, non-zero probability of picking actions that maybe were kind of bad, but might, might get better in the future. And uh, uh, we will say something about the proof. I'm already running. Ooh. OK. So you can prove that if you pick your eta uh, in, in the right way, you actually match the upper bound for any finite number of actions and for any uh, time horizon. And th this is including constants. And you can also have dynamic choices uh, which uh, uh, spare you from uh, knowing the horizon of the game that uh, will only lose a small constants with respect to this bound. OK, so this was done uh, a number of times uh, in game theory, uh, in information theory, and in computer science. Uh, maybe com computer science got the right constants and the right dependencies. OK, and, and, uh, uh, and, and the algorithm is also the simplest. To, uh, I think uh, it, it's, it's uh, the simplest possible algorithm you can think of. Good. So now. Uh, one variant which is very natural has been uh, heavily studied is the so-called non-stochastic bandit problem. And the difference is that uh, here is just like before, but now you get a lot less information because whenever uh, the player picks uh, some action, it will only observe the loss of the action that is uh, 
that it has picked. All the other losses will be there, but unknown to the player. And the player is still competing at the, against the best offline action, but now it gets a lot less information here. But, uh, you know, sometimes life is just good, and uh, the same thing basically still works. You just have, you know, you cannot compute uh, uh, the correct losses for each action because we have partial information. So you can just use estimates, uh, importance weighted estimates. So you divide, uh, whenever you pick a loss, you divide the loss, uh, whenever you pick an action, you divide the observed loss by the probability of picking that action. Otherwise, you just stick a zero into the vector. So you have a vector of losses at each time step, which, are, uh, which has only a non zero component. And this non zero component is, uh, has a larger value than the observed loss because you want to comp compensate for that many times you put a zero instead of putting the right loss. So it's very easy to see that uh, in, in expectation, this is an unbiased estimator. Okay, if you they make a conditional expectation with respect to P, the, the drawing of your actions, this is the right uh, expected value, and that the variance can be nicely bounded by the reciprocal of the probability. So now you can go, yeah, you, you, you can do the proof, and uh, the proof for the bandit case actually gets uh, the, the, the experts bound that you saw before as a byproduct. And uh, there is a very little algebra that it takes you here. Actually, it's all very little algebra. I teach it in the undergrad, and uh, they, I, they, they, they tell me they get it. You <laughs> never know. So uh, right, so you get up to here, so you can bound the regret by this constant term. And this term here, which contains the variances uh, times the probabilities. And this is just, uh, this is called the bandit magic, this product. It's a, it's a branded name. You cannot use it, but uh, you can pay royalties to me. And uh, right, so we know that the, this, the, ver the, spec the, the variance is upper bounded by the reciprocal, the probability. And so, well, this is actually the same, this is the same guy because the probability of the loss is observed in the bandit is the probability that the action is picked. So these two guys cancel, so you are summing up once and you're summing up t's and you get uh, uh, n and t and then you pick your eta and you get this nice thing, uh, which is, you know, just uh, a little worse than what you had, had for, the, for the experts, because in the experts you didn't have this term here, but you have a matching lower bound. And if you care about this log term, I don't, but uh, uh, these two guys did. And actually, they came up with a very nice and elegant solution. I'm trying to make up now because I'm saying that I don't care, but it's, you know, it's, it's a very nice result. And uh, so you can have a slightly more complicated strategy and, and get a matching lower bound. And OK, you can get the experts bound here, because in the experts, uh, the probability that you observe the loss is always 1, because you observe all losses. So now, uh, uh, what, what the hell? Here is, here is 1. And now you're summing up the probabilities, and you get 1. So you, instead of having uh, nt, you just have t. And then you tune, and you get your nice experts bound. OK, nice. So may, uh, variations. Variations are interesting, but I won't go into a um, lot of detail. So the first variation is, is the following. What is, OK, we, you started with game theory. But in game theory, we know, you know that adversaries are nastier than here. They're not oblivious. They not lay down losses beforehand and then let, let, let us uh, draw, uh, draw our pennies, our coins. They actually will adapt uh, to the outcomes of our past randomization. So now we can uh, uh, think of the situation in which the loss of an action at time t will depend uh, maybe on the past uh, m uh, place of the player. OK, let's give it some memory here. OK, and uh, one example, one very natural example is a bandit with switching cost. Uh, so whenever you stick to the same action, uh, you just pay the loss of that action. But whenever you switch action, then you pay an extra unit loss. OK? And you, in order to do that, uh, the adversary has to keep a memory of 1, because it has to remember what you played in the last, uh, act, in the last step. OK? So this is an, an instance of this uh, more general framework. And uh, so now you can define regrets. You can define a non-oblivious regret, which is just what we saw before. We just have the same thing, but we now have losses here that uh, are the actual losses with all their dependencies. Now this looks a little bit funny, because what we had before we could view this as the cumulative loss that the player could have gotten by playing the same, uh, you know, the single best strategy all the times. But here now, it doesn't have an interpretable uh, view because you see here th there's a contamination between I and uh, what the player actually, what the player did in the past. And uh, this 
So you cannot do this counterfactual reasoning anymore. Because, uh, right, so what you would like to have here, I'm just, just showing this so that it becomes clearer, you would like to have this thing here. Okay, what happens if I actually play consistently the single best action? This will be my cumulative loss. Not that, but this. Okay, so this is the right quantity to look at and to study in the, the uh, context of non-oblivious opponents. This is also useful if you want to prove uh, game theoretic properties like correlated equilibria using minimizing regret properties, but I'm not talking about that. So this has some uses, but uh, it somehow is more restricted. This is kind of the right thing to, to, to study whenever you have a non-oblivious adversary. So the adoptive adversary also knows the coin tosses of the algorithm? Uh, not, yes, up to time t minus one. The coin tosses also? Like. Yes, the outcome of the coin toss is up to time t minus one. Sure, right. that's the essence of, otherwise it's oblivious. Okay, so, well, XP3 is just amazing, uh, uh, and uh, not because I'm a co-author of the paper, but because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very versatile algorithm, and, uh, and Peter Auer is another co-author, uh, and uh, you have uh, Freund and Rob Shapiri are the two other co-authors. This, this paper has a funny story. Um, but I won't tell it here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, okay, so what happens? Uh, so if you have this, the kind of uh, silly regret, uh, XP3 will, will get you the same bound, even if the adversary knows the outcome of the past coins. Wow. And uh, one uh, open question here is whether, we, we cannot prove uh, actually the, the more sophisticated algorithm, the shaving off uh, the log factor, we cannot prove it in this case for non oblivious adversaries. So it's not known whether this factor is necessary. It's again, it's a log factor, if you like. Uh, then uh, it's for the policy regret, things are much harder. And it turns out, uh, there turns out that there's a phase transition here. So the, you don't have this nice uh, sort, of a, uh, uh, sort of a low large numbers kind of a square root of rate, square root of t rate, but you have a t to the two thirds rate because you're looking out at this more complicated, more sophisticated notions, uh, notion of uh, regret and your adversary is more powerful. And, uh, and unfortunately, it's a, the kind of a silly strategy that achieves this upper bound that you cannot do much, anything much clever. Proving a, low, a matching lower bound is much tougher, you have to, you cannot do a, a simple IID process to generate losses. You have to use a dependent process to generate losses. And there's a beautiful paper by Ofer de Kelle, Tumer Koren, and Yuval Perez, uh, who explain, explains how, which explains how to do it. And this is optimal up, up to log factors. Okay, so they, they get a, a matching lower bound, up to log factors. Okay, this is all for any constant memory of the adversary, at least one, okay? And if it's a strictly bigger than one, you'll have also the same lower bound and the same upper bound in the expert's case, in the full information case. So that's cool. I have, yeah, 10 minutes, nine minutes left, right? Yeah, a little more. A little sorry. more. Yeah, well, you know. Um, all right, so other variations. This is also very nice. It's called partial monitoring. This is generalization of, of, of bandits. So suppose that you're selling uh, t-shirts uh, on a website and uh, you know, every customer comes uh, and uh, you have a dynamic pricing policy and so you're trying to, make, trying to guess, the, to guess uh, the value that the customer has for your t-shirt and uh, to set the price uh, matching the value of the customer. The problem here, here is that, uh, you know, the customer won't ever tell you, oh, I, actually I could have bought this uh, t-shirt at a much higher price. They won't tell you, no? So now uh, what, what you get, actually get as a feedback is not uh, the loss. So suppose now the loss is, is the following. This is the price, this is the value for the customer, and this is the price that you, the posted price for, for that customer. So for instance, if you have a price of two and the customer has a had a value of four, you're losing two bucks because you could have sold it to the same customer as for $4 instead of $2, okay? And if you price it two and the customer put a value of one, then you're losing some uh, constant, uh, uh, some constant uh, number because your, your stock uh, is, you know, keeping the stock around is uh, costly, whatever. However, the feedback is only, what you get as a feedback is only sold, not sold, right? So what can you do here? Can you minimize regret in this situation when your feedback differs from the loss? You want to minimize regret with the loss, but you don't see the loss. You see it's just binary feedback. Can you do that? 
So there's a, okay, multi-armed band is a special case in which loss and feedback metrics are the same. So you play something, you see, and, and then you exactly see what you, the loss of what you played. Okay, so you're generalizing that scenario. So there's a beautiful theory, and uh, there are several papers, I'm just mentioning here some authors, Gabor Bartok, and now at Google, Dean Foster, now at Amazon, David Pal, now at Yahoo, and uh, Sasha Rackling uh, and uh, Chaba Sepeshvari, uh, they are academics still. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not now. So, and they have a constructive characterization of meaning max regret for any pair of loss feedback metrics. And there's a gap theory here, so there's a gap theorem. There's a beautiful phenomenon that basically, there are only three possible rates for any choice of loss and the feedback metrics. Either you have easy game like bandits in which you can get your square root T regret, I'm ignoring dependencies on the other parameters of the game. There are hard games in which, like the dynamic pricing game, in which you get t to the two thirds. And there are impossible games in which, you know, the, 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 the feedback metric is, doesn't give you useful information in order to minimize your loss, and there your get is linear. There are no other rates here. That's pretty amazing. And this is not trivial. I mean, it's, and I, I, I'm not a co-author indeed. Uh, so, so it's, um, it's, it's a very nice result, it's a very, very nice result. Unfortunately, uh, the algorithms are kind of, uh, are kind of things that you would, don't want to run, unlike uh, XP3 or, or Hedge. Okay, cool. Uh, what else do we have here? Okay, okay, we are heading towards the, uh, the, the after lunch session. So now I would like to, uh, I would like to channel you uh, towards uh, the, the kingdom on, uh, of online convex optimization. And I will do that uh, in a gentle way. And uh, uh, so the first thing I would like to, to see is just to, to view this um, uh, online prediction with expert advice as a, an equivalent in an equivalent way, way. So now, again, we are expert, we are doing the experts game and we have a full information, everything is known. We, everything you know, apart, apart from the future, so we know losses of all things we could have played, but we didn't. And so we can, you know, we can just assume that we are actually not playing an action, but we are, because we are actually, what we are scored with is the expected regret. So we can just assume we are playing, a, randomization here, here is in the full information game is not important because you have full information. Okay, so you can just assume that uh, you're not playing a single action, but you're playing uh, the probability. That's your action, a point at the simplex. And then you incur some linear loss, which is just the expectation of the probability with the loss vector. This is something you can compute, right? And then you can up, you do your little updates and you're happy. And you observe the loss gradient, which is because it's a linear action, it's a linear loss, you, you observe the loss vector, which is the gradient of the linear loss. Okay? And uh, so you can think uh, just for the sake of it, because it's not really useful, that you're competing against the best point in the simplex. Okay? So that's your, re that's your class of uh, strategies you're competing against, but because the loss is linear, this is just a saying that you're competing with the best corner of the simplex. It's a, say, it's a convex, uh, it's a simplex with the, with the linear loss. So you're competing with the corner, which it is again the, best act, the single best action. So you're not gaining anything here. You're just uh, shifting your representation in, in a game in which the game is now you play a point from a convex set. And you're, square, uh, you're scored with some loss that uh, is uh, maybe linear, maybe not, and then you observe the gradient of the loss, okay? Now you can keep these uh, ingredients in your mind and, and, uh, and uh, get to this slide, which is not really, why well, it's there, I don't know. Okay, this is just to remind you that uh, this analysis can be useful, if you're good, to, to, uh, uh, for uh, machine learning applications, because uh, this, uh, this is somehow I said it again, I said it before. You can view opponents move as value or labels assigned to observations, categories or, or documents, okay? And uh, so the observations and the labels are defining your losses. And then you can formulate uh, an online, learn machine, uh, online learning problem as a game between the player which is choosing some uh, maybe vector of a coefficients, a model, 
and uh, from a linear space, and the opponent is choosing a, a label from the data point, uh, the current data point. And then you want to measure regret against, uh, with respect to the best element in the linear space, so the best possible model in your model class. So, okay, this is the idea that this is sort of a, the, the, the way of thinking uh, uh, the sequential learning problem as abstractions of real uh, learning uh, problems. And I am done for this first part, and uh, thanks for your attention. Are there questions? Yes. Can you tell a little bit about the difference between phase number two and three of partial monitoring, the, the hard one that you don't learn and the one that you get uh, t to the board? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is the difference in terms of the feedback that you receive between the second and third? Well, um, but that's a, you, you can think of, of um, feedback matrices that are just uh, you know totally uncorrelated. Random. They're not to totally. They're, they don't. They're not correlated with the. You can. It's easy to get a linear regret here, right? Because uh, the loss matrix, the, the feedback matrix, can be completely uncorrelated with the loss. That uh, pricing, uh, the t-shirt? The, uh, the pricing price, is no? it's, uh, actually is, is very co much correlated. It's very much correlated. In the pricing case, just like in the revealing action case, uh, in the revealing action case in which is, is the case in which you have uh, one action that tells you, uh, the, that allows you to see the losses of all other actions, but you pay unit loss every time you check it. Okay. So if you, uh, you can design a, a, a feedback matrix which whenever you play that action, you have loss of one, but you see the losses of all other actions. And then whenever you play a different action, you only see the loss of that. Maybe you don't see any loss at all. This is a revealing game. And, and, and uh, now, uh, dynamic pricing uh, is, uh, is a little bit similar. They, they will have the same rate. Dynamic pricing has the same rate as a revealing game, t to the 2 thirds. And the here, it's kind of easy to see. I mean, it's easy because this is a full rank matrix. So you can basically design an estimator in which you reconstruct the loss metric by inverting the feedback matrix because it's full rank. So it will contain enough information to reconstruct, to estimate in an important weighted way all the entries of your loss matrix. So this is the bandit situation that you only... No, this is not the bandit situation. This is so dynamic the pricing. Thing. The dynamic pricing. No, I, I mean uh, in terms of getting feedback. In, in, in the bandit situation, you have the bandit magic. The bandit magic is what buys you the fast rate. No, 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 yes. so my question is different. So okay. Here, uh, when uh, you offer a price and the, uh, uh, and the customer, let's say, buys it, yes. you only get one for that specific customer. Nothing else is revealed. Yes. But yes. you still see, say that because of the matrix invertible and invertibility, you can get the T to the power. You can reconstruct. Yes, you can reconstruct it. Exactly. Yeah, this, these two things are known, of course. Otherwise, you cannot do anything. So you know these two matrices, but you, know, you don't know what are the, 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 the strategies, the YT, which are the columns here. Please. Yeah, okay. there was another question. Mm -hmm. yeah, my question, I guess, is related. Uh, are you saying that uh, a given loss matrix and the feedback matrix, you can you know in which of the three categories you are. You know what? Whether you are in the category, whether the the minimal regret will be square root of t or t to the two thirds. Yes, you can compute it. You can compute it. Yeah. Okay. It's constructive. Everything is constructive. Lunch break and two. Come back. <laughs>